Welcome all to the Learning You and SNHU Support Podcast. I'm your host, academic coach Kaylee Guzel, and this is a show for learners. Now, more than ever, people are learning online, and Southern New Hampshire University is leading the way. We empower all learners, working adults, military families, refugees, and everyone in between. We believe that knowledge is power, and access to education can change the world. Academic Support is a dedicated team employed by SNHU. We're at the front lines of helping students succeed. We've got our finger on the pulse of this institution because we talk to learners like you every day. More than basic proofreading or math help, our peer tutors and academic coaches listen to students' unique needs and help them with life's transferable skills beyond their schoolwork. We offer one-on-one and group experiences, need help last minute, we've got 24-7 drop-in support in a multitude of subject areas. Further, we build resources that help students teach themselves and discover their unique pathways to success. And now we have this show dedicated to what our learners are going through. Anxious about math? Terrified of writing? Struggling with time management or the work-life school balance? We're here to help you through. Today's topic is mindfulness for students, maybe a broad term, so I have some special guests here today to help me define it and make it work for you. You'll hear from academic coaches David Gonthier and Lydia Henry today. David, in addition to coaching, is a filmmaker and mindfulness teacher here in New Hampshire. Lydia has her PhD in history with a focus on gender and colonial India. She is one of our coaches who specializes in coaching English for speakers of other languages, as am I. She also coordinates today's featured academic support resource, the live chat. Stay tuned for more information on this helpful feature of academic support. Let's get into it. I want to introduce David Gonthier. David, hi, and welcome, and thanks for coming on. Hello, Kaylee. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so excited about this. Me too. I haven't breathed yet. <laughs> <laughs> How um, appropriate for what we're going to be talking about. <laughs> yes, deep and mindful diaphragmatic breaths. Um, so today our topic is mindfulness, as you know, and you're our resident academic support expert on that subject. Um, so I feel like it's best to start with some definitions of uh, what mindfulness isn't isn't sort of breakdown for listeners before we begin. So what is mindfulness according to your experience? The topic is so big. <laughs> and I think that when I thought about like how do you kind of we um kind of break it down, I just like starting off with um a quotation from basically the one of the mindfulness gurus, uh uh John Cabot Zinn, um, who basically defines uh mindfulness as paying attention on purpose in the present moment in a particular way and non-judgmentally. I love that. I love that because it's so succinct and it almost like it really kind of covers all the grounds of what, what the basic idea of what mindfulness is. But as I think a lot of us, you know, what we know or what we don't know about it um, is like it definitely has its roots in Eastern um, um, philosophy and, and religion, Buddhism very specifically. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's one of those things where it's one of those, it's it's to kind of go to the idea of like what it's not, I think is also just equally important too, because I think, you know, a lot of times it gets um, kind of tagged as just being, you know, something that, that might be actually specifically religious or even specifically spiritual. And it's really not, although mm-hmm. it can be. It's one of those things where it's where it's it's for the individual, the you know the individual who does practice you know certain religions or spirituality. This can actually really um, benefit, but at the same time, it can also be a secular practice. And and really, with the emphasis on the word practice, it's it's more or less kind of a vehicle into um, you know into finding ways to become you know um, less stressful, um, um, more emotionally intelligent. Emotional intelligence and mindfulness really go hand in hand with each other. Um, and, you know, and John Kabat-Zinn, he was kind of like the, you know, the foundation of the mindfulness-based stress reduction program that, um, that he started to, and he had nine attitudes, which I'll just list, but this, this gives us just kind of an idea of what they are. It's non-judging, acceptance, patience, beginner's mind, you know, being able to actually kind of go back to the beginning of, the, of, of, of something from the foundation, trust, non-striving, letting go 
gratitude and generosity. You know, some very general universal themes, but but I think they can really apply, you know, very effectively, you know, to 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 who we are individually. And what I do like about it is that it's so um it's first of all it's very it's a very forgiving practice. You know, it's not like it's it's so highly disciplined and it's it's you know, it's not like you've done it wrong, so therefore you have to start back over again. It's mm-hmm. really just has a lot of different things that you can actually kind of tap into. And it and it really gets you more conscious. It's it's slowing down, being aware. Um, even right now, as I speak, I I have the tendency to, to be fast paced <laughs> and high energy, but what it does sometimes is it gets you down to really isolate um, everything that you're talking about. So it really is, it's an awareness. It's a super awareness in the moment. Mm-hmm. I hope that answers it. In... <laughs> and hearing, yeah, that, that answers it in a lot of ways. I have a few follow-up questions, just, you know, some micro definitions of some of the things you said in there. And um, if you have any recommendations for John kabat books or websites, you can send me those after the show and we'll put them in the show notes for listeners to check out. Um, when you say non-judging and, and to not be judgmental about what you're experiencing, um, I think one of the most common misconceptions about mindfulness in general, and we'll get into how it works in academics and for your own self-awareness for learning, um, is that idea that mindfulness is about not thinking. So mindfulness gets equate with, equated with meditation. Meditation is the practice of like having no thoughts. What do you think about that? Um, yeah. Is it really a and misconception? It's a great question. Or and it is. It deal? really is a, a misconception, yeah. I think. And, um, and I think it's one of those mm-hmm. things where um, the idea of, of, first of all, not thinking, kind of pro- trying to program yourself to, to just sit there and not think is, is kind of almost an impossible task. At least a lot of other people would say that. I would say the mm. same thing. I think it's one of those things where you embrace the thoughts. Um, in addition to mindfulness, just kind of as a, as a brief side note, I also do a type of meditation called transcendental meditation, which I kind of fuse with with mindfulness. And it, it's, a, it's a very nice compliment. Um, and, and really what it is, it's just being alone with yourself, um, being able to actually understand that in our busy, chaotic lives that, that a lot of us have, most of us have, I'm sure, uh, that, that there's time for ourselves, that we can actually sit down and we can actually be with our thoughts. We can understand that we're going to have a very busy day, that, um, that we're not going to necessarily allow our thoughts to dissipate. You know, that's, that might you know, not even be the, the best way of doing it. You want to be able to embrace it. So if you are feeling anxious, if you are feeling angry, if you're feeling um, melancholy, it's all those stuff. It's, it's going back to the, the original definition or one of them of awareness. It's kind of being in that place of kind of saying, you know what, this is what I, this is what I am right now. And then having that sense of awareness can actually put you in a really good position to to do something about it, to kind of control it, to be able to control that, you know, maybe not mm-hmm. with, yeah. yeah move with, through it even. Absolutely. Yeah, get to the other side. Yeah. So, um, yeah. So that, yeah, again, these are, these are very big questions for such a big topic too. So it's, it's, it's interesting to try to, yeah. Yeah. We'll definitely yeah. narrow it down to the whole, you know, making it about <laughs> college thing. Um, Cause I know that my Aquarius self and your Gemini self could just yes. go on forever about Absolutely. it generally. Yeah. So I have, I have a few <laughs> That's another um, show, I think. pathways to narrow it down. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Um, we'll start it. We'll start our own mindfulness yeah. chat. Um, another guru who I really enjoy, she's actually a psychologist who got really into Buddhism and mindfulness and she has a podcast. Um, I think it's just goes by her name. Her name's Tara Brock, B-R-A-C-H, and I'll put her information in the show notes too. She does a lot of that self-compassion stuff. So I think when we're trying something new, like learning again or going back to college after 20 years, in this case, in this, uh, you know, lens, um, there can be a lot of beating yourself up or getting really overwhelmed and, her practice that she coined is called RAIN, Recognize, Allow, Investigate, and Nurture. And that starts with the recognizing that you're having a feeling or a thought that you don't like and accepting that it's there. Um, simply saying to yourself, okay, anxiety is here, stress is here, overwhelm is here, and allowing it to be there. I think some of the pushing it down can create. Mm, of course. more problems 
Um, so to get over to some learning stuff, since this is a learning podcast, mm -hmm. you teach mindfulness at a local community college still, I yes? I do. And how does mindfulness come up for your students? And how can how have you found that they can use it to learn better? Yeah. Well, there's a um, at, at the community college at um, New Hampshire Technical Institute, they've actually over the years developed a uh, um, quite a profound mindfulness program that um, that actually has has you know it took a while to to, to, to get going, um, and then now it's part of the curriculum. Um, the um, IT students actually have an option now of doing a um, um, a mindfulness certificate that goes along with their major. But to be honest with you, looking, I've been teaching it for a, a number of years now too, and it's 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 it kind of an interesting pattern that I see over and over again. That um, especially a lot of the students that that don't really know what it is, or kind of link it, you know, to kind of the misconceptions. It's like, okay, well, it's it's based to it's based on religion or it's meditation only, you know. Really, kind of find that it's there's so much more to it, um, and but you know, at the beginning, a lot of them do come in skeptical. You know, because there's just like, well, you know, what is this? It's very new. And then we, we introduce it to the pro into the program. Like I do a mindfulness and literature course, like, for instance, like where we, we will we will uh, talk about um, certain pieces of literature. I know like what, one of the, we do the play Harvey, the, the, the great comedy, Mary Chase play Harvey. And we take a look at how that might um, emulate uh, mindfulness ideas and concepts. And and over time, these ideas, along with a lot of self-assessments, uh, end up kind of really, play, you know, playing into the big picture. So by the end of the semester, I often find that students are, are in the, the mode of self-reflection where they're really taking taking a, a solid look at themselves. And I've found, and I'm very much the same way too, we love talking and learning about ourselves. You know, so when it's mm -hmm. there's the opportunity for me to say, you know what, this is how I learn. These are what my challenges are. But this is also what my, you know, that that there's there's something very whole about that, and I think that's what what mindfulness tends to do too. It actually, it, it, it's a wonderful vehicle into 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 the whole self, you know, into into trying to understand why we're learning, why we're in a specific place, and to go back, um, Kaylee, to what you were saying just a, a moment ago about um, almost like this idea of um, self, you know, like um, kind of like a mindfulness as being like a, uh, um, a vehicle in, into um, self nurturing. I'm trying to remember the the name of the person that you talked about too. There's actually Tara Brock and self yeah, and there's actually yeah. not. So, do any of the exercises that you do in class um, have anything about that in there, or can you talk about any of those specific reflections you have students yeah. do? I was yeah, yeah, those are reflections. And then, it, it, basically, there's um, I actually took a mindfulness based re stress reduction course, and we're just going to kind of back up for a second, just kind of say at that at that course, I actually one of the my biggest takeaways from that that course was that it was all about self um, um, self reflection and self nurturing, which to me was very new at the time. That it was like you know I have the right to be kind to myself to be nurturing to myself and that it's okay to kind of slow down and say how am i doing that mm -hmm. uh, you know is a very powerful thing that i learned and i bring that over into the class you know and we do it through exercises we do it through self reflections and i find that there's there's a lot of comfort that the students have with that as well too you know because it it, it becomes nice. a nice vehicle into not only themselves but what they're learning too and that's it's a nice combination and those are all writing exercises that you do, so like sort of journals or essays? journals. I have them do, yeah, journals. I have them do um, uh, papers on that, um, and then th probably the best <laughs> measure of this at the end of the semester is I have them do a multimedia um, final presentation, and a lot of them end up doing like um, something creative, or it could actually even be like a kind of a um, a YouTube video. But what they do is they take the mindfulness concepts too, and they apply it to to um, you know to who they are. Um, so it's it's part discipline of, of what the content is, but it's also mostly taking a look at why they're learning. And what I like about mindfulness in education is it helps answer that question that I, I know so many of our students um, have of like, well, why am I learning this stuff? You know, you're in a literature mm -hmm. course or we're in a writing class. It's like, what do I need this for? I'm not going to be a literary scholar. I'm not going to be a writer. You know, so, which I'm sure a lot of you. So, yeah. Sure. And then so what mindfulness helps you do is, is it, it, it kind of helps give you a framework of who you are as a person, helps you get whole. It helps you become, you know, um, emotionally intelligent, which I think is a, you know, you could do a, probably a whole podcast on that alone. You know, the idea of empathy. Well, and, can you can you shortlist yeah. it? Can you think of maybe if we were talking about emotional intelligence for the listener who's never heard of it? Um, are there 
what are maybe some practices or when I think of emotional intelligence, I would think about my own self-awareness, mm -hmm. you know, hearing myself speak, hearing myself think, self-talk, um, but also relational things, whether it be between students or a student mm -hmm. and a teacher or spouse and a spouse. Um, a lot of our students have children. So what are some of the benefits of having mindful emotional intelligence yeah in the grand scheme of life well i think yeah that's a great question because in the end that is what it's all about yeah it's it's making it very holistic but i think a key word would be empathy you know teaching kind of kind of compassion empathy and the idea of emotional intelligence really to kind of put it um, um to sum it up it's putting yourself in somebody else's shoes and then taking a look at all of these other you know things like acceptance and you know, um, and the, the lessons that you can have from that too. And a lot of sharing a lot of stories of my experiences and growth, I think is super powerful. And, and, and you know, because I'm humbling myself, you know, because I, I tell my students, you know what, mindfulness is an ongoing practice. It's like, I haven't, I don't come, I didn't come from some mountain <laughs> with the knowledge and here I am to, to profess it. I'm actually, and it's hard. It's, it's hard, but, but mm -hmm. it's so worth what, you know, um, and then I, I share stories of challenges. I mean, there was, one, there was one time when I was, I was driving back from, from a, from a class and I was really in a, in a, in a poor mood. I was, I was tired and all that stuff. And somebody was flashing their high beams at me and I flashed them back. But I found out at the end, oh, this person is actually warning me that there's like a family of deer that's crossing the road. <laughs> Mm. And that, for some reason, that does something happen to me after that. And I realized that, that that was some sort of an epiphany. And I was meant to have that as a learning experience, because then I realized, wait a minute, I was really out of my element. I was giving these mm -hmm. false accusations or whatever to something that was completely false, which I'm wondering how often we do that. You know, when we look at somebody's actions, but then we're, we're, we're not, we don't really realize what the real reason is. And I share that story. Mm -hmm. um, and as, as a humbling learning experience. And I find that students really like sure. that too, you know. And that, that actually connects just for listeners new to this, to that, uh, I believe it's the last thing on John Kabat-Zinn's list, generosity, assuming the best in people, assuming the best in your own efforts um, before you react. It's very difficult. It is, no, and that's the thing. It's like, because it depends, <laughs> that's why the moment is, is all you have. It's like, because think about it, you know, mm -hmm. the moment, you know, you're, we're, we're moody because of certain things that are not being met or, you know, in the same time, you know, it's, these are the things that have to happen. And yeah, so it is, it's, it's an ongoing thing. And that's why I, I, I kind of really helped students realize too, that why it's really worth it. You know, it's not just a discipline that you learn and you move on, but it's really just, it's, it's, it's an ongoing thing and we, we can all learn from each other and that's, that can be pretty powerful. Mm -hmm. Love that. Very powerful stuff. Mm. Very interesting stuff. So I'm going to, I'm going to go into the abyss as I call it and talk about depression and anxiety. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> and I can be pretty silly and flippant sometimes, but it's a serious thing, especially in these quarantine times. And um, David, you and I work for the global campus. So the one that's entirely online and we are one of the few teams that's directly student facing has conversations on the phone with students on a daily basis and are kind of another human being in the dark or in the cloud <laughs> <laughs> um so with that in mind are there any specific mindfulness exercises for things like anxiety depression loneliness uh, disconnection that you have found to be useful yeah for yourself or for your students or, or do you do anything like that in your work here at SNHU yeah. that you want to share? Yeah, no, great question. I think before even looking at exercises is to understand the power of mindfulness of being in the moment. I know that's one of the things that, that, that people keep saying, well, it's in the moment, in the moment. And when you think of depression, you know, in a, in a very broad scope too, you're, you're, you're stuck in the past a lot of times. Depression is bad and anxiety is anticipation for the future. You know, again, when right. you really strip it down to its base, so so again, the, the 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 those two kind of extremes too is kind of like one of those, you know, I guess um, reasons why you know it it can be a good idea to to actually understand well how can you actually kind of stay in the middle, again, not easy, and that's the, that's the whole thing too. Whenever mm -hmm. we talk about this, and if I claim that I've got all of the answers at the time, you don't. You know, it's mm -hmm. a, it's yeah, it's an ongoing thing, and then exercises are one of the um um. 
the biggest uh, exercises that's broken up into many different, you know, kind of mini, you know, meditations or just moments are breathing exercises. As as simple as it sounds, you know, you're just sitting there and you're 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 taking in your breath. You know, so we're simple. You know, kind of hold in, bring bring your breath in, hold it. You know, kind of count for a few seconds, then then ex, you know, breathe out, then do the same. Um, and I can't tell you like even like health benefits over the years. Or just a simple, mm. a simple thing like that, just you know, blood pressure lowering, um, good for blood sugars. Um, it's it's um, it also helps ground you, you know, as 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 a mm-hmm. person too. I think we should do it right yeah. now. Let's do a four pause. Four. Sure. Yeah. Okay, listeners, we're gonna breathe in for four, mm-hmm. three, two, one. Hold it, and out for four, three. Two, one. Do not listen to this podcast while driving your car or operating machinery <laughs> because you are so calm right now. Very good. <laughs> um, those things can be re- really simple too. Anything like with bodily awareness too, I'm sure you can attest to. Um, I have people in my life who have chronic illness, chronic pain, and um, that woman Tara Brock I mentioned at the beginning has a lot of great meditations for that, where you you focus your attention on a body part that doesn't hurt, right. and um, so your back hurts, and you you think about your hands, and you feel the energy and the the tingling in your hands, and it just gives you a break. Um, and awesome. then there are meditations Anything too. Yeah, besides... just really quickly too. To, yeah, just saying that there are meditations mm-hmm. too that actually focus kind of like on the opposite of that too. Is like it embraces. The, the discomfort, you know, there's actually, um, there's actually a soles of your feet meditation that, that um, we do in our communicating mindfully course um, that it's just like, you're, you're sitting there and you're being very aware of like all body parts. And one of the things is like being very aware of what, how you're feeling at that particular moment. Are you tired? Are you lethargic? Are you high energy? Mm-hmm. You know, um, you know, and then being aware of like any aches and pains that you might have, you know, do you have a, you know, um, a, a, a sore shoulder do you have anything like and then just being very aware of that and 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 going back to the idea of non-judgment too which can really help too. just be like okay well i'm kind of living with this right now um now not exactly um buddhism but like that ha- actually has buddhism I- ideas to it too it's like it's kind of like you're, you're you're taking in the sensations and you're just being very aware of it and it builds strength and character but um yeah have you ever heard of wim hof now that we're just no, like dropping I don't think names. So. I think he's Swedish or he's from the yeah, North. He's, he's a Nordic man. Um, and he's like probably in his 70s and he's got this really thick accent, very beardy in his <laughs> whole practice. And this is just for me to give learners an example of how many entryways there are into mindfulness. It doesn't have to be breathing. It could be yoga if you yeah. if you have so much for me it's yoga because i can't really sit still very often um but i can be aware while i'm moving um for wim hof it's the cold so he like jumps into arctic seas and takes cold showers and he says the cold is your teacher (laughs) (laughs) um which is anybody in the northeast with us probably doesn't want to do that because it's like no. 20 degrees today. That's um, great, though, because it, it does. But, it, yeah, there's lots of pathways yeah, to no, it. Yeah, no, I'm so glad you said that, too, because I think that, that can go back to the beginning of, like, the, the miscon you know, conceptions of what mindfulness is. It's a lot of things, you know, it's and it's it can actually be journaling. You know, one thing that we do with our students mm-hmm. a lot, too, is, is you know, and for students that don't feel comfortable meditating, for instance, you know, we encourage it, but but at the same time, we don't force it because that would kind of go against some a lot of <laughs> what mindfulness is about. Right. You know, if they were sit and exactly. be calm. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no thoughts. No thoughts. Breathe for me now. Yes, exactly. Yeah. So we give options of like, okay, you can. There, there, there are things like journaling. There are things like you know, um, you know, how could can you write about it? Um, even cr- just creative energy, and that's another thing that I love so much about it too, is being a you know, one of those guys that just loves like the creative arts. I mean, as I think, mm-hmm. you know, I, I do music, I do film, and I think it's all kind of one thing, you know, that that's kind of all grounded. But but mindfulness can really kind of help into that. So it's a it's a wonderful, you know, vehicle into that sort of space too for for those interested, you know, in that sure. sort of expression. Well, thank you. Um, just as a transition, 
before we start talking to guest number two, we talked about self-compassion. If any of this was over your head, listeners, um, David and I have been pretty into this topic for a long time. Um, But we're going to shift more into some direct practical practices and some resources from SNHU's offerings. Um, Just as a transition, are there any... um, practices about being a coach that you think are uh, mindfulness based, even if when we were training and learning how to be a coach? Well, let's, let's take one step back, actually. What is an academic coach and what do you, what do you do as one? It's, um, in coaching and teaching, I think they're, they're, they're kind of one and the same, despite what some people think, you know, it's like, oh, they're, di- they're different. Mm-hmm. You know, I think that the, you know, it's, it's, I, th- we comment on papers, I know, because it's not, it's for true, grade. but I think it's, 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 um, you know, and I think parenting you can put in here too. It's, it's the, the intention is to work closely, even collaborate with one or more, you know, individuals and with it, with the intention of, of empowering them with the intention of, of making them self-sufficient. You know, um, and I, we kind of throw this cognitive word around too, but metacognition, which I know that that's a word that we love to talk about quite a bit here too, because it, it relates to thinking, thinking, about, thinking about thinking, thinking right? Because it kind of reflects mm-hmm. what a big part of our mission is in terms of non-directive coaching. You know, that idea of like, you know, we're, we're here as guides, we're here to support, we're here to, um, you know, and we're here to find those, those tools, you know, to, to help guide the students. I had a wonderful meeting last night with a student too, where she, she just completely took the reins, you know, and it was just like, she was sharing her screen, you know, she's telling me this is the part of the essay that was working and it wasn't. And I, I was very aware of that at the end. I'm like, this is an ideal coaching session because, you know, you needed my help. For, for obvious reasons too, but then at the same time we were able to kind of put her in, a, you know, help go in a direction where she felt confident, secure, and empowered. You know, mm-hmm. so she was doing the work. Yeah, and I think mindfulness reflects all, you know, all that stuff. <laughs> all that, all, all that, that jazz. Stuff. Um, and one, I think one more thing just to plop in here before we transition is um, inquiry and how essential that is to learning and to coaching. Um, as an academic coach, we learn the practice of asking curious questions to encourage students to come to their own conclusions, answer their own inquiries about <clears throat> whether it's feedback from a professor or instructor that confuses you or um, looking at a prompt for an assignment that seems huge and overwhelming. The curious questions can really break it down into steps, and that's a big part of it, too. So with that, I will thank you, David. You can stay with us and please chime okay. in for the rest of the conversation. We're going to do kind of like a move down the couch. But I'd like to introduce Lydia Henry. She's an academic coach, and she's also um, one of the English as a Second Language expertises <laughs> like me. So um, we coach with one other woman in our in our group, the students who are... Immigrants, children of immigrants, or other, otherwise need support with the English language in addition to their schooling and studies. Um, and she's the uh, live chat coordinator. So, hello, Lydia. Hi, hello, hi everyone. Welcome, Thank you my so dear. much for having me. I welcome, actually welcome. love talking about the live chat because I really believe in the effectiveness of that particular platform for engaging with students and helping them so thanks for love that can you tell us more about it and um what students uh in circumstances the live yeah, chat serves? absolutely um the live chat is an interactive actually live resource available to all snhu students um, and learners and even competency-based courses uh, campus students um It is a text-based interface where learners come in and connect with coaches, tutors, and get real-time answers to basically to quick questions. Um, It's where one can sort of drop in to access any academic support team members, and that means both our peer tutors who tend to be um, content specialists in particular areas, um, and they are current or former SNHU students, um, 
as well as our academic coaches. And you can access them and get assistance with many of the things Kaylee has already mentioned, sort of the basic functionings of the learning process, such as how and where to access the resources that we provide, comprehending rubrics and the language that rubrics use, um, getting some quick, immediate content help or possibly citation aid on something that a student is working on with a paper or a set of math theorems or IT coding. And it's also just a really nice touch point for all other services that we offer. It allows students to engage with us in an empathetic and engaged environment. And it can really help a student get through sort of those small impasses or obstacles um, that they're having with a current assignment, competency, or goal. And sometimes that goal is just, you know, how to email a professor to get clarity on feedback. I mean, it could be, we, we have, have a, resource a resource for that. that. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Um, so it sounds like it gives the the learners who check in there, and and this is, you know, exclusively an SNHU offering. So if you don't go to our college yet, our university yet, please do and enjoy the live chat. Um, <clears throat> but it's a good place to get some direction. I think the live chat is a great place for like on the spot, just in time stuckness. Yes. <laughs> Where am I? Yes, absolutely. Can happen in the cloud. Um, great. Thank you for that definition. And uh, just really quickly, how do, how do current students access the live so chat? So current students um, for all but a very tiny um, cohort, it is embedded in each learner's Brightspace course. Um, right in the academic support module. And it's actually the, if you count over from the home, it's the fourth um, option on the top menu. So you can see it right there. It's called live chat. Um, the program we use is actually a specialized portal, um, which the academic support team staffs through the Shapiro Library, where the Shapiro Library has the chat with the librarian 24-7. We have kind of our own entry point through that, and that's um, how students can get to it. So because it is also connected with the library, um, we can engage with students from other universities as well, though the majority of them are our current students. Um, and instructors often um, come in and ask questions um, to find resources. And at, at least one instance, a member of university leadership um, came into the chat for help with a very intricate MLA citation question, but my lips are sealed on who that was. So, <laughs> oh, <laughs> intriguing Intrigue. indeed. Love that. So <clears throat> I'll repeat the pathway again later, but it's Brightspace course, any which yes. one you're in, modules, academic support. And then get help with your schoolwork. And behind that curtain are all of our offerings, including yes. live chat. Thank you. Okay, so let's uh, shift back to the uh, now that we're in the nitty gritty, the mindfulness topic. And David, feel free to chime in. This is a family yes, is. table. Um, <clears throat> what are some opportunities you see for today's topic, mindfulness, in a place like the live like, chat? Like David mentioned earlier, mindfulness is large. It's a very all-encompassing term. Um, and to kind of recapitulate that quotation he gave us, it's, you know, in the live chat, it's very much about paying attention in the current moment. Um, it's a great space for making connections and creating connection, which I believe are two slightly different things, um, two slightly different types of interaction. Um, but well, Go you on. can, <laughs> yes, I shall. Um, <laughs> a learner can come in and engage with a highly trained academic support coach or tutor who are going to provide a sounding board and non judgmental help. Um, the chat is a place to be heard. We engage with learners in an open and curious manner, asking those curious questions that you had mentioned, Kay, earlier, and practice acceptance and non judgment. And above all, again, not to kind of go at this ad nauseum, but it's just to be empathetic, to be empathetic to learners mm -hmm. in need. And that need may be very small um, and it might be uh, quite large. It can 
being mindful in the live chat for both the student and for the academic support team is to en enhance your ability to be and keep present in the conversations that you're having. We strive to engage that way with students in the chat at every time. It doesn't matter if you're asking a question about hanging indents or JavaScript, or maybe you've had a really difficult experience in a course and you're considering um, you know, dropping it. And you know, you have a, a highly trained person there to, to kind of talk through that with in a really t a meaningful touch point, like I said, in an empathetic manner. Sure. So you're not getting a bot. We're not people. a bot. Very much. So don't so don't talk to us like we're a bot either. Okay. <laughs> and um, I love that. I like I like that uh, two sides of the coin of you could come in because you're not sure if the period goes in and in, in or outside the quotation or parenthesis, or your house just fell into a chasm, and everything is terrible and um, you have some real life barrier or block at hand. Um, these are all things that we're trained for in academic support and we're proud of about our team. Um, and you can access that through any experience with a, a peer tutor or a coach with us. So the live chat's just kind of a a quick way. It's a nice modern way because it's a tippity type. Yeah, um, and the live chat David, is often the anything? first place students Oops, go to get aid from academic support. It just kind of happens to be one of those, you know, sort of those entry points to academic support. Um, mm -hmm. And the qualities of kind of mindfulness and being there at the core of how we interact with each learner. And obviously that must seem true when we're having, you know, a really in-depth 45-minute video chat screen sharing moment but it can also happen in a in a text format in a chat um we try to meet you know students in the place that they are so it's important not to assume that a student knows or does not know something and you know again those mm -hmm. probing questions those curious questions to get further information before we just kind of throw a resource at them you know we really try to engage with mm -hmm. that student with the question that they are coming to us with did you want to add anything? To no, you? I was the, what I was going to say before Lydia said it um, as a form of mirroring, <laughs> which is which is perfect. We're on the same wavelength. Is that um, you know one of the one of the the ideas that we talk about it, that goes all the way back to one of our, our supervisors, Aaron, you know who um, you know who who basically um, has this idea that we should really be meeting students where the, where they're at, you know. And I know that that's something that keeps and, and I think that's a that in itself is innately mindful, I think, right? Where we, you know, it's, you know, because I think we can set students at ease a lot too when they come to us and thinking, well, you know what? I didn't write this complete paper and, you know, I'm not sure if it's okay for me to be with you right now. And, you know, and mm -hmm. I think that, they, which, you know, when we kind of reiterate the fact that it's like, no, we meet you where you are, <laughs> you know, you can, we can mm -hmm. brainstorm, we, we can hang out, get to know each other and see what you, you your fears are or, or what your strengths are, you know, all that good stuff. Because I find that, a lot of the personal stuff feeds the content and vice versa. Yeah. So meeting, meeting yeah, them where, where there are. Yeah. In the moment. <laughs> yeah. And saying things like, you know, can you tell me what you're struggling with and then we can figure out how to work on this together? Or would you like to show me how you think we solve this problem? And then we can try to solve another one together. It's just mm -hmm. really constantly framing our interactions in the sense of we are working together we are coaching, we are not just providing an answer, not just providing a resource, but really helping you understand where you need to go for that next stage of whatever you're working on, paper, or theorem, whatever. We've had a lot of math students lately. I, I seem to be harping on it. I usually use um, Python as my <laughs> example for everything um, because it just seems so foreign to me as someone with a writing background, but um, and our history background. So I'm trying to branch out and I'm using Java instead of Python. So I, I hope everyone really appreciates that. <laughs> Thank you, Java. Um, <clears throat> and I want to reassure any listeners who are perhaps not super into this hippy dippy writer conversation um, that we will have some of our STEM tutors on the show soon. And that's one reason, one reason the, the meeting students where they are, learners where they are thing that's really important and I think reflects in what academic support has become. Um, 
David and Lydia and I have been on this team for many years now. And when we began, it was just the online writing center. Now it's branched out to so many modalities, subject areas, etc. And I think a reason for all those modalities, by modalities, I mean mediums that you can have a one-on-one -on -one conversation. You can go to a workshop. You can join a small group and meet with the same group of peers consistently every week. And we'll talk about all these in subsequent shows. Um, but the reason you can watch a video by yourself and teach yourself APA, we would love that. <laughs> <laughs> so um, the reason for all that is the meeting the student where they are. If, if you don't have time to sit down and have a conversation with a coach for 45 minutes, I, I wish you could. But in the meantime, we have all these videos. Um, so it's nice to have different entry points, you know, it's the same way you could have different entry points to mindfulness. It could be deep healing breath or jumping into the Arctic Ocean. I don't know. <laughs> you decide. Pick your own adventure. Any last things we think that listeners should know, keeping in mind that we are hoping that we have listeners, A, because this is the pilot episode, and two, <laughs> um, that some of the listeners go to SNHU and some do not. By the way, if I ever said snoo, late disclaimer, that's how we locals say SNHU. <laughs> so that's what that means. Um, I think I was supposed to say that at the beginning at some point, but again, out of breath. Um, I have a list of kind of quick topics to sum up what we've covered tonight um but do you do you have anything else well you, you had um asked me to think about um any social media info that i might want to share and i did just take a quick think on it and um i do have a suggestion oh, okay. if anybody is interested it um touches upon kind of a few of the interests that i have and it's um uh, I follow them on Instagram, um, Just Seeds, which is a cooperative of socially engaged kind of radical artists and printmakers. Um, and the work they do kind of highlights um, all sorts of movements ac across the globe. They're not just U.S. movements and through time. So they do a lot of historical ones again. So that's really, you know, kind of where it gets to my heart. Um, and, mm -hmm. you know, it's all about people's movements. And they're also really beautifully aesthetically pleasing to me. So back to well, bringing all of the things back to Lydia, which is that I love art, diversity, and history. So, And the live chat, Great. obviously. Awesome. We'll put... <laughs> and the live chat. Go there. Awesome. So um, just to reiterate to listeners, I'll, I'll put everything we've mentioned in the show notes. So that Instagram account that Lydia just mentioned and um, links to the Tara Brock show on Spotify and any websites or books that David has for uh, John Kabat-Zinn to get to know him. He is a lovely person. We'll put those in the show notes for you to check out the wisdom. Any last thoughts from you, dear David? I think I'm going to elect to choose a mindfulness <laughs> practice of, of, of listening <laughs> and just keeping quiet. <laughs> Because yep. the other twin of his Gemini is here and he's listening. <laughs> he's quiet. Okay, great. Love that. All right, so let's just sum up what we've just learned. Um, mindfulness is a lot of things, but it's not an empty head. You're allowed to have thoughts, feelings, reactions. The trick is to accept them, move through them, and not let them get in your way. In our next episode, we'll be talking about motivation. And um, I hope to have each episode be standalone. But if you are, if you do become a rabid fan of this show, then uh, I will connect some of the things that we've mentioned today in the next episode to keep you motivated. Um, another point, you can practice mindfulness around studying, anxiety, interacting with peers, staff, instructors, time management, personal relationships, yourself, self-compassion, and more. All you need is to start with your current moment and notice it. Um, the live chat is a great resource for quick questions, on-demand support, and direct or next direction or next steps so you can keep on learning. Though often students come to live chat, live chat stress, try to come with a few questions for us before you come in. So that's just a, a tip if you want to have success in your first experience in live chat. Um, try to have some idea of, of what you don't know. And even if you don't, we'll meet you there. We'll figure it out friend. 
Um, and finally, you can access live chat from the academic support module in Brightspace. So just to uh, reiterate that pathway for current students, your Brightspace course, if you have one, very few of you don't, <laughs> Brightspace course, academic support under modules, and click get help with your schoolwork. And the live chat is there amongst Fourth everything the else. Um, <laughs> fourth in the row and uh, we're not open 24-7 like the library but uh, we're there on weekends and evenings and that's we're there 12 nice. hours a day seven days if, a week 12 hours a day seven days a week and if you miss us you can file a ticket and the next coach will um, reply to you via email so I just want to thank my guests. This has been excellent. Thank you so much for your wisdom and your friendship and your love over the years. Um, you really help students succeed and feel heard and safe and lovely. And I love that. So just to, to outro us, that's it for today, everyone. I'd like to close this episode with an excerpt from Academic Support's mission. Just is just a piece of it. We believe that all learners are capable of growth with support and collaboration. So come and collaborate with us. Existing students can find academic support under modules in your courses. And if you're not learning with SNHU yet, think about it. You'll have the best support system in higher ed behind you. Visit snhu.edu to learn more. This has been Learning You, a support podcast with Coach Kaylee Guzel. And from all of us at Academic Support, thank you for tuning in, and we hope to work with you soon. 